I will now go ahead and tell you all of these mushrooms. Okay. So hi fungi friends. Gabrielle and I were out on the Mendocino coast today. And we found all these beautiful mushrooms in a chaotic and fun and amazingly fascinated uh, foray. We got a bunch of fun, fun fungi to play with and I'm gonna teach you all about them. Um, so one of the most brilliant and beautiful mushrooms we found today is this incredible, incredible Romaria aria spora. It's a uh, ectomycorrhizal mushroom. Uh, as far as I know, I think it associates with the tan oak here, uh, but it springs up in these like brilliant little clusters and then it matures and kind of fans out and the spores are dispersed on these little kind of like coral like branches. Um, this is an edible mushroom. I would eat it sparingly just because Romaria in general can uh, make you uh, shit your pants for lack of a better word, but um, they have a laxative effect. That's a, that's a more civilized way of saying that, laxative effect. But they're pretty tasty and you cook this up, the juice turns red, it's really cool looking. Uh, so that's Romaria aryospora out in the same habitat. We also had uh, Romaria uh, botrytis or tan oak red, is the sort of the western uh, west coast version of this mushroom. Botrytis is a European species designation, but Everything we have here is probably a West Coast version, not the European species. So this is also edible sparingly, um, be really nice and crunchy when it's this young. But those are two sort of beautiful, cool ectomyc ectomycorrhizal uh, coral mushrooms. Then we have this nice, big, beautiful uh, Matsutake. And this has just phenomenal taps. And I like tapping mushrooms because it speaks to me about the integrity of that mushroom the structure, the resonance. There's a special timber even to each special mushroom and the kinds of taps you can give it. And even like different parts of mushrooms sound different. I think it's pretty cool. So Matsutake is this beautiful, uh, aromatic, very dense, meaty uh, mushroom that is highly valued in Asian cuisines in particular and commands a pretty high value price on the like Japanese and uh, Chinese Korean mushroom market kind of thing. Uh, they in the 90s there was a whole trade of them being shipped from like Oregon over to Japan. They were selling for huge amounts of money, but now they've they sourced most of their matsutake for China and uh, Japan from plantations over there. So there's less of that trade happening now, but they're still pretty good mushrooms, and they grow here in California mostly with tan oak, but sometimes you also find them under spruce and pine in different parts of the state and heading up into Oregon. Uh, a little button like this is probably the best. And you can tell the true Matsutake because it's not never have a pure white cap. There's no like belly button, no umbinate center like a Russell Brevipus has. When you dig it up out of the ground, it'll always have this sort of sandy base on it. And that's a really important distinguishing feature because I also saw Smith's Amanita out there, which is a lookalike, deadly toxic lookalike that you could possibly mistake uh, this for. The one that people more often get mistaken as Matsutake and as not is Catatholisma, the imperial cat, and that tends to be a lot bigger. It doesn't have the sandy bottom, um, and it doesn't have this very characteristic smell of a Matsutake, which is a sort of like seafoody, cinnamon, spicy, chemical odor, uh, and it's it can be really good in dishes, but it can also be a little bit polarizing, so some people feel weird about Matsutake, don't always like eating it. Um, I do enjoy it, but I serve it more with Asian flavors like soy and dashi uh, than I would with sort of, you know, butter and herbs like most American Western treatments of mushrooms. So that's Matsutake. Uh, what else do we have on board? We have the only Ascos, Ask My Seeds here on the board, is beautiful, weird, funky little Helvella Vespertina. Uh, so these were growing, looked like saprobically sort of on uh, duff, but I'm pretty sure they're associated with some of the conifers out there. So they probably live part of their life cycle as endophytes inside of those conifers, the same way like the morels do with their host trees. But these are really funky looking. Um, you can dry these out and make them edible, but if you're gonna try to eat them fresh, it's a good idea to boil them first and blow off uh, some of the toxins that might be on there. Because if you ate these straight up, they, they could be a little bit toxic. Um, here we have a dyer's polypore. So a squishy uh, yellow polypore that'll eventually turn into a big fanned out brown thing. And it's a butt rot fungi growing on a lot of the pine and dug fir trees. This is inedible, but you can dye fabrics with it. Also has a very strong UV reaction and KOH reaction. Uh, right here, I have a little, uh, what's called rhizopogon. And I usually say rhizopogon, but Alan Rockefeller uh, uses this pronunciation of rhizopogon, and I think it sounds like an amazing like sci-fi name. Um, these are cool little uh, sort of truffle-like 
fungi that are really important associates of pine trees and help them uh, grow in difficult conditions. And is one of the main things they actually inoculate pine trees with in a commercial uh, forestry setting is rhizopagon. Um, it's also, if you've ever seen the beautiful snow plant, big beautiful red spikes of red flowers that come out of the, the soil in the spring and summer in the Sierras and Cascade Mountains, they feed on the mycelium of uh, rhizopagon or rhizopogon. Uh, so these are really cool. And inside they're kind of just like foam and they sound like floral foam. Um, they're edible, but they don't taste good and they have the texture of foam. So they're, they're not great. Um, this, by contrast, is one of my absolute favorite edible mushrooms. This is the candy cap, Lactarius rubidus. So this is a diminutive, tiny little coppery brown uh, Lactarius that has sort of white to clear latex and usually a little bit of a fuzzy foot and very brittle stem. And sometimes it gets attacked by hypomyces, but you know these look these look pretty good. And uh, they the latex doesn't stain any color. There's a look-alike Xanthogalactus with the latex stains yellow. Um, but these have this sort of just beautiful little coppery top and brittle stem, like I said. And their biggest dist distinguishing feature is that they smell like maple. So there's a compound in here called Sotolon, which smells like maple. And it's literally the same compound that's in maple syrup that's in this mushroom. And it gets strengthened when you dry it out. So I'll be drying these to add to my collection of candy caps, which I then use in syrups and desserts. Uh, sometimes I put them in whiskey. I have brewed beer with them. You can do all sorts of awesome things with candy caps. Uh, there's another Lactarius, and this is something you may recognize. This is what's called like a saffron milk cap, uh, but this is Lactarius deliciosus group. We have like 12 different species of these guys in California. Some are better than others. These were from Mendocino. I'm pretty sure they were with, with Doug fir, um, but it's wild, sort of wild orange color. It turns a little green. You can hear Tiger Paw, my cat, voicing her displeasure at the patriarchy. I know, I know Tiger Paw, fight the patriarchy. Okay, so here is uh, the yellow foot chanterelle. Uh, this is a craterellus, not, not a true cantharellus chanterelle, but it is beautiful little chrome yellow foot. And uh, this, I think this is actually uh, craterellus pacificus or something like that. It's it, tubiformis is a kind of like the common species name, but there's all these different little variations around the world in species. Yeah, winter chanterelles. Um, for some people, they grow in the summer. Like when I'm in Massachusetts, there's the same kind of craterellus grows. Uh, it's a little bit oranger, more orange, and you know, flavor's pretty much the same. Habitat's often the same. It likes moss. Uh, but that's that's a summer one, and then this is a winter one here in California. And I've seen this in Alaska growing, you know, in the middle of summer, all sorts of stuff like that. So, uh, so that's that's a craterellus rather than a true chanterelle. And here we have a true chanterelle, cantharellus. This is cantharellus formosus, kind of the classic golden chanterelle. And these are smaller and less meaty than the Cantharellus californicus, which I found a couple days ago here in Napa under oak. Uh, but there's also Cantharellus uh, subalbitus, which is this beautiful white chanterelle. So I believe this is associated maybe with a tan oak, but also pine, something like that. Um, it has these decurrent ridges, same as a uh, golden chanterelle. Uh, but these are ridges as opposed to uh, true gills and so that means that I can't really like bend or break them they're pretty blunt and uh, they're decurrent which means they run down the stem like this and they'll have white flesh inside that's gonna stain like a tiny bit orange um, but when you cut them open they'll be white and they'll usually be solid in the middle uh, but these are chanterelles they also have a white spore print very importantly um, pretty much all of these are edible except for uh, really there's nothing here that you couldn't eat except for possibly a dyer's polypore. Anyhow, yeah, so this is the white chanterelle and this is the, uh, the golden chanterelle. Back here we have hedgehogs. So this is hydnum, probably hydnum organensis. Beautiful pinky mushrooms. These are like the belly button hedgehogs. They have a little like dimple in the top here. Uh, but they're super good for beginners because they have these little teeth and there's really nothing out there that has the little teeth and is this color. There's a few other tooth fungi like Hydnellum, but those are really like bitter and they don't look like this color. Uh, there's Sarcodon, which are pretty big and meaty, but the ones we have here in California aren't very good edibles. Um, they also have tiny teeth, but not the same pink color. So basically you see, I find a little like pink cap with a belly button in the middle 
and teeth underneath, this is going to be an excellent mushroom uh, to eat and to cook. Uh, it's one of my wine favorites. It will also last quite a long time in the fridge. So hedgehogs are great. It's a nice big pile of them there. Uh, we have some Clotosibi nuda, the classic bluet mushroom, which is a white spored saprobe. Uh, we actually found this one growing in like a pile of trash and like an abandoned couch that someone put on the side of the road, but here's a bluet. It smells classically like uh, frozen orange juice concentrate. It's kind of my, my cell dis uh, smell descriptor for it, but that is, that's a classic bluet. Um, we have the big boy back here. This is... Lexinum manzanite, uh, sometimes known as the apple bolete or manzanita bolete. But this has excellent taps. Um, so this is a scaber stalk or lexinum. It has these little black scabers all over the stalk. Nice taps on that. Uh, so we also got an actual porcini. So that's a lexinum. Sometimes they call them birch bolets, but I think a scaber stalk is a better name given the common feature of the scabers on the stock. We also got a little bit of a chewed on, but a porcini nonetheless. Um, this is pretty good taps to it. Yeah, the lexinum will stain a little bit blue kind of erratically, but not because it's active, just because that's what it does. Some bolets stain blue and it's not has nothing to do with psilocybin. We cannot talk about magic mushrooms. Please don't bring them up um, because I'm trying to do educational mushroom content and unfortunately TikTok deems anything related to psilocybe as illegal and will immediately ban it, so please don't mention it. Uh, these, again, these are all legal edible mushrooms. Uh, I am just trying to show you how to recognize edible stuff and learn about mushrooms. So this is a beefsteak fungus. So this is a polypore mushroom that's grown on a, I think a wax myrtle, but also grows on chinkapin oak here in California. Um, so it's tiny little tubes underneath and little pores where the, um, the spores come out of. But it's sort of sitting on the side of a sh like a shelf thing like this, and I cut into it, and it reveals this beautiful, like marbled meat pattern, which is really awesome. It's fistula and hepatica. I know that uh, Gabrielle Chaotic Forger posted a, a cool video about this mushroom recently. You should go watch that if you haven't seen it. So there we go, beautiful meaty mushroom. But this is edible. You can eat it raw. It has a flavor a little bit like uh, lemon juice. It's got a lot of oxalic acid, so it's kind of crunchy and a little sour and has, uh, it reminds me of something in between like tuna and raw tomato and watermelon in terms of like texture. Uh, so there you go, that's the fistula and hepatica beefsteak. It's pretty cool. Then we have the ever popular Amanita muscaria, also maligned, misunderstood, this poor mushroom. Uh, people think it's trippy, people think it's deadly, people think it's uh, edible, it's all, all these different misconceptions. So what I can tell you, and I've done a bunch of videos about this, so please go watch them if you want to hear this again, but Amanita muscaria is a toxic mushroom in that it contains ibotenic acid, which can make you puke and have diarrhea, and muscimol, which is a dissociative sedative that can put you to sleep and even put you in a coma if you have too much, and in small amounts might make you kind of drowsy and a little bit like uh, delirious and that's that's the kind of trippy part it's not like tripping like philosophy it's just delirium it's also a legal mushroom it grows all around the world we as human beings have moved it to every single continent through the timber trade it's a super common mycorrhizal associate that's very competitive and it grows with a lot of pine trees a lot of different conifers uh, you can eat this if you double boil it and just uh, take some of the, the muscimol and ibotenic acid out of it. Uh, you can boil it and then use it like you would a normal mushroom. But I'd be really careful because it still can make you sick uh, if you're not careful and you're not totally sure what you're doing. But it's a very good recognizable mushroom. And it's a great one to get to know, like the basic anatomy of a mushroom. And that with an amanita, you have uh, down here what's called a vulva, which when it's young is essentially, it's called a universal egg. So uh, Amanita starts its life as essentially a little egg-shaped thing, and then the um, stalk rises up and the cap opens up and starts dispersing the spores. So down here, this is called the vulva, then this is the stem or the stipe. Up here, there'll be a little bit of a partial veil, which will then form a skirt or annulus around the uh, stipe and leave a little imprint there. And then you'll see the gills inside. Right now, they're covered by that partial veil. Uh, and then on top, you see remnants of this partial veil as little dots on the amanita. So that's what that is. And there you go, it, it matures from this little egg into this big one. Um, I'm gonna take this little egg and try to time-lapse it and get a cool footage of this thing growing up 
into a bigger mushroom. Let's see. Okay, I'm not going to lose my place. I'm going to stay focused. Next, we're on to zero camellus. So this is probably zero camellus. I think it's atroperpius, something like that. Uh, but it has this beautiful red stem that's like reflecting the light in a really pretty way. It has this incredible fuzzy purple suede top and these yellow angled pores that will stain a little bit blue if you mess around with them. Uh, Zero Camellus is a decent edible. It doesn't have great texture or flavor, but it's pretty good if you dry it out and powder it. Um, but I really like these. Sometimes they call them Zeller's Bolites, but technically it's a different species up in Washington. The one we have here in California is, uh, is a little different, but similar. It's just marginal differences in like the spores and stape and stuff like that. And then we have this beautiful purple mushroom that Gabrielle picked up. Uh, this is the Purple Western Deceiver or Lacaria amethysta occidentalis. Um, very uh, fibrous stipe here, but beautiful purple gills. Absolutely gorgeous and white spores that come out of this. This is edible, but the stipe would be pretty uh, fibrous and the top part doesn't have a ton of flavor, uh, but it is, it is a really, really beautiful mushroom. So that is, that's pretty much everything on the board. 